When you sign up for the fellowship program, you're saying, I love science and technology and engineering, but I want to think about it in a broader context. I want to have an impact in a, in a bigger world. I was looking for something different to do. I was trying to find a different path than the one I'd always expected to be on. And a congressional fellowship, that's really where it all started. The early 1970s were a critical moment for U.S. science policy. The environment, energy, space exploration, and other science-related issues were high on the national agenda. The AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships were founded to assure that top quality technical expertise was available to elected officials and policymakers. The idea was simple. Scientists and engineers would take a year off and come to Washington, D.C., where they would work in congressional offices or federal agencies. The first class in 1973 had seven fellows, but over the next four decades, demand for their expertise grew exponentially, and so did their impact. Now as we approach our 40th year of this AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships, we have more than 2,500 alumni who are working all over the world. They're working in many different sectors, academia, industry, nonprofits, and of course government as well. One of the exciting things about the program is that all of those individuals have taken the experience they've had in Washington, D.C., the understanding that they have not only about how policy is made, but the importance of science informing policy to engage in the work that they've done throughout the rest of the careers. In the 1970s and 80s, Washington could seem like a foreign landscape to a scientist. But quite quickly, fellows from those early classes went to work on high-profile, high-stakes issues. For some, that work was a springboard to prominence and influence in U.S. policy and diplomacy. The uh, founders of the program um, contacted me uh, because they were concerned they were starting it with very little lead time and they were concerned that they wouldn't have enough applicants and asked whether I would apply. And as it turned out, they had a hundred applicants for three places in that first year. This was a moment when Congress really was wrestling with how do we get more advice, more help, more and so there was, uh, so it was a wonderful, very fertile moment. I was a classic first generation Indian immigrant kid. My mom started sentences with, when you get a PhD, and she wa it wasn't a joke, it was just sort of an expectation. And, and so I dutifully went off to college and got a bachelor's degree and then dutifully went off to graduate school. And I had always thought that I would go be a tenure track professor at some university after I finished. But I actually didn't get that much joy out of sitting by myself in a lab at two in the morning and saying, Eureka! At the time that I applied, I was on the faculty of Swarthmore College, teaching physics and some public policy and even uh, a couple of religion courses, um, primarily physics, uh, although I'd done a number of different things. As soon as I heard about the uh, AAAS Fellows Program, it sounded perfect for me. When I was elected to Congress, one of my seventh grade teachers came to visit me and he reminded me that in the seventh grade I had my own subscription to the Washington Post and Scientific American. So I guess I was on both paths straddling those two worlds um, uh, from the early years. There were dozens and dozens of issues at that time, chemical regulation, nuclear policy issues, where there was tremendous energy issues. This was the year of the first Arab oil embargo, so all of a sudden energy became a huge issue. So there were lots of issues where that had a substantial scientific component. And, um, and as I say, almost nobody on the Hill had any real scientific background. Come out of a scientific career, you think that maybe you know, rational arguments are the, the sole way that decisions are made. Uh, so coming and working in Washington was kind of an eye-opening experience. It felt like there was a real need for my technical background. I mean, I even did a poster session in my office about molecular biology because grants were beginning to come in using that technology. So it seemed like there was a, a real desire for more information and people who could communicate both in terms of policy and science. Most people were trying to grapple with the problems facing the country. They had. Uh, big political battles, but I, I think there was this, uh, this spirit anyway of trying to come up with uh, solutions uh, among the, the political parties. 
at the same time, there were not a lot of scientists around. Um, there were a lot of technical people in USAID at the time. And there were some scientists from the Department of Agriculture that, you know, were in place. But the year of my fellowship, USAID had four, I think, fellows. And I think now they have ten times that or more. Almost every issue back then, and certainly is true now, there is, I, I feel, some a very important component of it, you know, where science is, technology is highly relevant. It may not be the, certainly not the only factor in, in political decisions, but very important. We were starting to see digital media forms the entertainment industry was very concerned about copyright and what uh, what the implications would be and of course in the years since then we've seen how much it's affected those industries we were at the very beginning of that landscape it was a very good time actually for being sort of a, a young person with a scientific background coming to work on the hill new fellows often experience some culture shock Politics, unlike science, is not a purely rational process, but Washington offers a rich opportunity to learn and to build a bridge between cultures. The work is demanding, but it's exciting too, so much so that today about half of the AAAS fellows stay in the policy realm after their fellowships end. You had your, your professional staff that really did understand what was going on at a, at a deep level and that there was good discussion and discourse, and yet at the political level, there was often a disconnect. And, and that was something that until you see it firsthand, I don't think you fully appreciate. Just having people there in D.C. in those offices at the opportune time, you know, the right time with the right information or the, the ability to find the right information quickly. You know, you might only have a two-hour window to get that information and, and get it to your boss so that it's either brought up on the floor during a, a discussion or it's inserted into a bill that's, you know, being crafted in the middle of the night. The scientists became more informed of budget processes uh, and other things. I think they became more, more active about championing investments in research and development. Oh, I think there are a number of specific examples you can point to where fellows have been responsible for key legislation or pieces of legislation uh, that affect our lives, I think, for the better now. It's not just the scientific background and understanding the physics and the chemistry of what's going on that really makes a difference and I think makes a fellow effective in Washington, D.C. It's the ability to directly tackle a problem, to know how to look at data. Scientists are trained um, to be able to quantify uncertainty. And since that's so much about what Congress has to do, it's an incredibly valuable uh, set of skills. Some of the fellows stay on the Hill, some of them stay in Washington doing policy or lobbying or other kinds of work, and some of them go back to the professions. It serves to um, illuminate the policy and legislative work and to enrich the professions by bringing a political savvy back to the, back to the professions. That's uh, uh, really an unbeatable combination. Some fellows made their careers in Washington, and others leave for points across the United States. Chris Rothfuss took his experience out west, where he serves as a Wyoming state senator and an assistant professor at the University of Wyoming. What I teach is, is directly derived from my fellowship, and it, it's interesting. I, I feel good about the, the courses I teach. I teach a course on nanotechnology for the honors program that is largely based, I've got a scientific background in nanotechnology, but I also have a policy background. When I was at the State Department, I was basically the U.S. lead for nanotechnology foreign policy. I've brought that knowledge and background basically to this course, which is not, it's not a science course. It's a multidisciplinary course that I teach. Another course I teach is called Diplomacy and Negotiations, and it's for the International Studies uh, Department, which I, I'm an adjunct professor of international studies here. I teach that course basically to provide them the students with a good view of what the State Department is like, what it would take to work at the State Department and how things operate, and then give them practice in negotiations based on an understanding of how to negotiate from a diplomatic standpoint. Gordon Day is back in Boulder, Colorado, but the fellowship honed his big picture perspective. It has directly shaped his work as president of IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Now as the, as the president of, of all of IEEE, the international organization, I find myself wanting to bring the organization into policy discussions that are global in nature. 
So we're looking at areas where the technical community and the engineering community in particular can speak out on, on issues that really have a, a worldwide uh, importance and impact. Based in Wisconsin, Ellen Bergfeld is the leader of National Agricultural Organizations. Her work covers issues with national and international significance, education, hunger, and climate. Our organizations right now are working across the board with other scientific societies as well as our industry partners because our industry partners came to us a couple years ago and said, look, we don't see enough, uh, you know, K through 12 kids coming into um, the classroom who are interested in how we're going to produce enough food to feed the global population by 2050. Uh, we need the best and the brightest coming into our our agricultural science, you know, disciplines, so that they can help us solve these world problems. So it's all of the issues that we're seeing, you know, the drought issues, climate change issues, feeding the world, doing it sustainably. All of those come together, and you know, the, our best opportunity to solve these issues is through science. Clearly, the fellowships have had an impact on U.S. science policy, but many former fellows acknowledge another, more personal impact, a powerful boost to their careers. I think it was a stroke of genius that this program was created. Honestly, a, a, the fellowship opportunity is just such a cool opportunity. It's a very stimulating uh, uh, intellectual environment. The expertise that I gained, the knowledge that I gained, understanding uh, policy at a, at a deep level, provided me with not only the understanding but the confidence to provide the leadership that, that I've been able to provide in the Wyoming legislature. It's a wonderful opportunity. It had a pretty dramatic effect on my career. Completely changed um, life for me. I wouldn't be in Congress now if it hadn't been for the Fellows Program. Consider the big picture. The fellows work day to day on issues across the fields of science and engineering. Through skill and hard work, their influence grows. Over the span of 40 classes, more than 2,500 fellows have transformed science policy in the United States, and the effects extend around the world. I think it's had a very, you know, sort of permeating dramatic effect in that there's this, there's space of scientific, um, you know, wisdom, knowledge, or experience that is now throughout the government that wasn't necessarily there before. DARPA's had a series of highly successful program managers and executives in our organization and it turns out that if you trace the history all the way back, they, they first came to Washington as congressional fellows. And, and I don't think that's an accident. It's a benefit for the members of Congress to have someone with some expertise on their staff, as well as it's beneficial to have those individuals learning about, you know, what, you know, how does policy get done? You know, what do you have to go through in order to compromise and get to the end result? Um, it's just, it's critical and, and it's amazing just to see how far we've come. The scientific revolution I think has accelerated, it's moving even faster and I think most countries realize now that if they're going to compete in this globalized world they've got to be more expert in science technology, how it's connected to innovation, how it relates to economic development. Today, the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship is a robust institution. The program has partnerships with more than 30 science and engineering societies. A record 279 fellows were accepted into the 40th class, and they're working in Congress, the White House, the State Department, and more than 20 federal agencies. Together, they form a far-flung network, a network of knowledge to advance global science policy. I quite regularly have contact with the office where I worked, uh, when they have new fellow candidates come to interview with them, uh, they often give them my name and the names of other uh, former fellows there. So uh, I would say probably most years I talk to a potential fellow in the office where I worked. Well, one of the pleasures of my job in the State Department is the steward for several of the fellowship programs, including the AAAS fellows that come to work in the State Department. Uh, for roughly in their first or second year right now, they're roughly 40. There are approximately 60 former fellows that are now regular employees in the State Department. Uh, and this is over, built up over uh, two decades. So the human capacity to deal with science in the State Department has just been tremendously increased. And if they, if they form a great network. If you uh, want to find out what's going on in a various part, part of this large bureaucracy, you find out who is the current or the former fellow that, that's working there. Whatever the technical or scientific experience a fellow might bring. Typically they've been very focused on that and, and the fellowship year brings your head up and shows you this huge landscape and gives you context. 
I think it's it's a, an amazing accomplishment and something that if we if we hadn't done it, if AAAS hadn't done this, it would have put us back you know, decades. Um, having people like Rush Holt, you know, in Congress advocating for science and doing so and educating his fellow members of Congress is so important. But then also having it, um, you know, having individuals like myself and others have the opportunity to learn more about the process and then take that out of DC and disseminate that information across the country. So it's uh, kind of a, a cross-cultural exchange where everyone benefits from learning.